like to ask you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We've been talking about light and darkness, and we will continue letting God talk to us about light and darkness. As a church, uh, during this summer, you have been exploring the opportunities to join God in the neighborhood, been hearing about that and talking about that, and I'm encouraged by that because I see God doing some great things in the neighborhood, and you're going to hear more about some of those things, I think, in weeks to come. Um, And it's important that we continue to focus on joining God in the neighborhood, because the natural course of things for all human beings is simply to stay in the middle of what's comfortable. That is, to keep with our routines and the programs, the things that we're familiar with, and uh, Listen, there's great enjoyment and comfort in the brothers and sisters in Christ, the relationships that we have, and we can enjoy that and forget that there's a world out there that doesn't know anything about that. And so it's important always for churches to focus on what's going on out there in the neighborhood because that's our mission, that's why we exist. That is, that's why we exist here and now. You might say, well, our purpose as believers is to worship God, and we're going to be doing that for all eternity. That's the main thing. Absolutely, that, that's true. But why are you worshiping God here instead of in heaven? It would be so much better in heaven, won't it? I mean, these people are very talented up here, but I'm thinking the music in heaven is going to be a little better even, right? Why are we here still? Jesus has saved us. Why don't we just go to heaven and worship him there for all eternity? For them, that's why. For the people that don't know him. The people who are in darkness. Now in the middle of chapter 5 of Ephesians is this verse, verse 8, and we're going to kind of use that as the fulcrum for our thinking for the next few minutes. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live or walk as children of of light. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Darkness and light is the theme here. Darkness and light. And the thing that has impressed me about this passage and and is impressing me in the last few years is what exactly we find when we get out there in the neighborhood. And I don't know what neighborhood you live in. Some of you live in a very nice, orderly, typical suburban neighborhood. So there's children's swings in the backyard, and there's a dog, a a little dog that costs a lot of money in the yard, and two cars that are kept in a garage, and the yards are mowed. Maybe that's your neighborhood. Or it could be that you live in a neighborhood like the neighborhood that this church building is in. Building, community, presence means you must pay attention to this neighborhood. And that's not a suburban neighborhood. That's not that. And maybe that's your neighborhood. At least corporately it is your neighborhood. Maybe you live in an upscale neighborhood and there's no houses in your neighborhood that cost less than $350,000, maybe. But if you join God in the neighborhood, whatever neighborhood it is, what are you going to find there? Ephesians 5.8 tells us you're going to find darkness. But now what does that mean? What can you expect? What should you be prepared for as you join God in the neighborhood? What does that look like? It's interesting, this concept of darkness. Paul says in verse 8, for you were once darkness. So whatever darkness is, it's part of your experience. You were once darkness. You might say, well, not me, because you see, I grew up in a Christian home, and I got saved in Bible school when I was five years of age, and, and our home was very orderly and disciplined, and we had family devotions, and blah, 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 it was all perfect. I get that. And really, that's kind of my story a lot. You might say, well, I've never been darkness. Yeah, you have. And just stop and think about this. If all of those infinite measures of God's mercy and grace and kindness had not been poured out on you, where would you be? Here's where you'd be. Darkness. 
But Paul actually, in the book of Ephesians, wants to remind people about darkness. He does that several times. So if you look, go back to chapter 2, this is the first time he reminds people what he means when he said in chapter 5, you were once darkness. So chapter 2, verse 1 starts this way. As for you, you were, you're not now, but you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. That's what we were, and that's darkness. Now, there's a lot of things to point out there, including satanic and demonic darkness and its effect upon our world. And make no mistake about it, it is affecting our world. We're just so enlightened that we have learned to call things by other names and ignore the spiritual realities that are happening all around us. We medicate it and we institutionalize it, but it is there. But that's not what I'm talking about. Look what it says in verse 3. Gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. This is what you're going to find in the neighborhood because this is darkness. People who are completely obsessed with themselves. Whose every moment of every day, the the operative question is, what do I want and how will I get it? That's what you find in the neighborhood. And that is darkness. People addicted to self. Now, some of those people can do nice things for other people and they can pursue their own selfish ends in very socially acceptable ways so that it doesn't look like the worst kind of selfishness, but in fact, their hearts and their minds are addicted to self. What I want and how I'm going to get it. That's darkness, and that's what you will find in this world. You should have some experience of that because you are, at the end of the day, a human being. Perhaps acted upon by the miraculous grace of God and indwelt by the Spirit of God, and yet the vestiges of your humanness remain, and you want stuff too. And you think about how to get stuff too. And what if that was all of your life? That's what you'll find in the neighborhood. And that's true no matter what kind of neighborhood you live in, because that's in the human heart. Chapter 4, Paul gives another glimpse of what you were. Chapter 4, verse 17, he says this, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. And he means the other Gentiles, those outside of the body of Christ, not believers. Don't live like the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Now note this. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Well, that sounds like that selfish living, but notice that it's operating in their heads too. The futility of their thinking, darkened in their understanding, ignorance. Because you don't know God, you don't know you don't understand life because God is the source of life, and you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle to put together in order to make good decisions in this world. I'm constantly surprised, this is going to sound unkind, but let me just say it, by the stupid things people do. You ever wonder where they get contestants for the Jerry Springer show? Do they go out there and give a dumb test? Here, you're stupid enough to be on this show because you listen to their stories and say, what what were you thinking? But we have other examples like the Dr. Phil show in which he gets to shine as the paragon of wisdom and knowledge so that he can ask the question, how's that working for you? And you you think about what the the mess that these people are in, and and how about this? Why do they want to be on TV if they do the stupid things, right? And and so often I meet people in the neighborhood and I think, why are you doing this? Often it's this, I I say, that is so short-sighted. You make that decision, that's going to be good for today, and that's going to mess you up tomorrow and for the next years. 
why are you so short-sighted? And then I remember, oh yeah, some of these people, they're not looking to the future because they don't have one. They don't have a future. They're trying to make it through the day, literally. They don't have all of the pieces to make what you and I would call a wise decision. So their thinking is futile. It leads them down wrong paths. They do counterproductive things, things that have consequences that are going to get them way further away from where they think they're going and want to be. What's wrong? What's wrong? That's what you're going to find in the neighborhood. People whose thinking isn't working right, they're darkened in their understanding because without God, without a future, without hope, without peace, you don't have all the elements to put together to make a wise decision in the long run. That's the darkness you'll find in this neighborhood. Which brings us into chapter 5. Darkness in the neighborhood. For instance, in verse 8, for you were once darkness. Look at the word for. That's pointing you up to the context immediately preceding, right? Whatever you said, therefore you were once darkness. And look what he's describing there. Even though you are dearly loved, called to be imitators of God, living a life of love, here's what you used to be, and if you're not careful, you can fall into these patterns, verse 3. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. Notice that there is a them versus us in this passage. That is politically incorrect, I realize that. But it's also true that some of us, by the mercy and grace of God, quite apart from our own deserving of it, have been rescued. We, the rescued, live differently from those, the as yet unrescued. And this is how they live. So this is what you could expect when you go into the neighborhood. You can expect to run into sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking. That's what you can expect. Now listen, there are people in every neighborhood who are kind, relatively responsible people who pay their bills, they're good citizens, by and large they keep the laws, they love their children and their grandchildren. They help out their neighbor when there's a kid. There's always in every neighborhood people like that. And yet you will also find, listen, in every neighborhood, people who are being described right here, sexual immorality and impurity, obscenity, foolish talk, just some examples of what you will find in the neighborhood. When I say that, it's based upon what Scripture says, and God in his mercy is teaching me some things about the neighborhood. Because you can probably tell by looking at me or listening to me that my life has been pretty comfortable. I grew up with my mom and dad, biological parents, in my home for my entire childhood. That alone makes me an oddity in our culture. And my parents worked, and they paid their bills, and they taught us to be responsible. And most importantly, they told us the gospel. They talked to us about Jesus. Scripture was read in our home and followed. And we were expected to behave a certain way, and to think a certain way, and to talk a certain way. In the course of my life, has come out of that. So you see how sheltered and unaware of what the real world, the rest of the world, would be like. And so later now in my life, I'm beginning to learn 
We first came to Indiana to Tabor 25 years ago, and shortly after that, a young man began visiting. Tabor is way out in the country south of here. I, you, you can't find it unless you really want to. And, but a young man came from town here because he had some connections with somebody in the church that I can't remember. His name was Michael, a single guy, probably in his late 20s. And he was very open and warm, and we, the kind of person you'd think was fruitful to spend some time with. And so I visited him, and he told me where he lived on 11th Street, less than a mile from here, almost straight south of here on 11th Street. And so I visited him. I came up to the house and realized I'm not going to get in the front door. Nobody comes in the front door because it's full of furniture and junk. Nobody's gotten through that door in years. There was a door on the side, so I made my way toward that door and realized immediately that because of his, I'm going to try to be nice here because it's Sunday, because of his two large dogs, I was going to have to very carefully tiptoe through the yard if I could make it. This isn't the way I grew up. This isn't the way I lived. This is the way he lived. And when I went into the house, I found a shower running constantly with huge orange stains on the wall because just the water never quit running. Almost no furniture in the house. I would not, you would not want to eat anything prepared in that so-called kitchen. And this is where he lived. God was introducing me to that neighborhood. Some years later, we got a call from a man just a few blocks actually from there over on Elm Street. I'm saying this again because this is close to the neighborhood that this church building exists in, within a mile of here. We get calls all the time from people wanting food or help with a bill or whatever. All churches do. Ask whoever answers the phone and they'll tell you. So one of these guys, he said he had some children that were living with him and he needed some food. He wasn't asking for money, he was asking for food. To, to me, that sounds different. But we don't just hand out money, so we went to visit him. And so we went to visit him on Elm Street to the house and he was a little surprised to see us because even though we said we were coming, he didn't believe us. Because everybody says that kind of thing. But we showed up there, Brad, our co-pastor and I went, and we had food with us, and we wanted to talk to him, see what was going on. And without going into great detail, it became clear that he was scamming us, that there were children sometimes living there that belonged to one of his relatives <laughs> who visited sometimes. See what I'm saying? And he was just trying to get stuff. Why? because he hates God and churches and he was trying to screw over all these. No, because this is how that man has survived his entire life. That's how he lives. God was introducing me to the neighborhood. Then somebody in our church began working in a prison ministry and developing relationships there, discipling people. And one of those men, a sexual offender, got out of prison and needed to locate some place so he located in your neighborhood, not far from here, continued to come to our church. It has lots of children in it, right? And so we have to think through how do we love this man and help him grow in Christ and develop a profitable life with care and discernment. You see, God was introducing us to the darkness in the neighborhood, right? And I could go on and on. And I think for us, for Jennifer and I, this is my wife Jennifer here, for us, uh, the big education <laughs> in the neighborhood was when our son and his wife, college graduates, decided that they didn't really care about the American dream and they wanted to invest in your neighborhood and they live less than a mile from here, just south of here, on purpose, because they want to engage with people whose brokenness is a little bit more on the surface and obvious. And so the people that we've met through them, their neighbors, 
and their friends have been a wonderful education in what God loves and is investing in. Darkness. We've seen darkness, and it's sad, and it makes you mad sometimes, and you think how stupid this is, and you wonder if there's any remedy. Your neighborhood where you live might be a little bit more buttoned down and look good until you look under the surface and find people just as addicted to self, just as much impurity behind the scenes, wrong, short-sighted thinking all through their lives, even if on the outside it looks a little bit more put together. It's darkness. And so this text says, for once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live, walk, literally walk as children of light. Paul uses the word walk when he's referring to daily life, the regular engagement in this world of your time and energy, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is your walk. And we are to walk as children of light because we are light in the Lord. That's the point that he's making here. And that's the exhortation. This world is dark. Again, whatever your neighborhood is, and we know something about the neighborhood this church is in, right? And I think corporately, First Baptist Church has some responsibility to the neighborhood in which it meets, even if you drive from some distance. And that's true of Tabor, too. People drive from some distance, but there's some corporate responsibility. As you think about engaging God, there's darkness there, and in that darkness you are called to be light. Now, the Bible uses light and darkness, that metaphor, often for different things. Sometimes light refers to knowledge, so darkness is ignorance or error or deceit, right? We use it that way. Somebody has seen the light, they've clued in, or... He's in the dark, means he doesn't know something. So knowledge versus ignorance, light and darkness. Sometimes it's light means righteousness, and then darkness would be evil, okay? And and we see that in this passage as well. Sometimes light refers to life, and darkness refers to death. We get that connection. Darkness and death kind of go together. Ooh, that's dark, we say. So life and light go together. The light of life, Scripture talks about. So you have to stop and think about what really he's referring to, but really several of those things appear here. So read with me from verses 8 of chapter 5 through 14. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all, get this, goodness, righteousness, and truth. Notice that light bears fruit because it's alive, light and life. And the fruit is righteousness and truth. See, all of these concepts come out. Verse 11, verse 10, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The reason that you are not darkness any longer, the reason that you are light is because Christ has shined on you. That too is a metaphor. What I mean is this. Because God graciously and mercifully revealed to you who Jesus Christ really is and put him in front of you in his glory and goodness, so that you bowed to him, believed in him, submitted to him, trusted him, and confessed your sins in his presence, and trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins, life and light came into you. That song, And Can It Be. The dungeon flamed with light. My heart was free. That's, again, a description of what happens when a person meets Christ. Christ will shine on you. You have life, and you have light. That's the reason why you are you and not them in the biblical sense of the word, because Christ has shined on you. Now, this passage tells us a little bit about what it will mean now to walk in this world as the light. And notice this is what you are, not what you do. 
for you are light. There's other passages of scripture that talk about being light or shining light or carrying light and so on. And in fact, you're probably going to hear some more about those in coming weeks. But this particular passage says simply you are light. In other words, the idea isn't here's your agenda. Go tick off this to-do list when you get out in the neighborhood. No. It may be good to have a plan and a goal and so on, but that's just not what this passage is talking about. It's just telling you what you are because Christ has changed you. So being in the neighborhood, joining God in the neighborhood, you're just going to be that. Just go there and you will be that because Christ has made you that. Be there. That's kind of what he's saying here. But here's what it's going to involve if we're actually walking in the light. Number one, it says here, it means we'll have to find out what pleases the Lord. Do you see that? Find out what pleases the Lord. I'd just like to ask the Apostle Paul, I mean, he's obviously a much better Christian than me. Why don't you just write down here what pleases the Lord? Why do we have to find it out? Just tell us. Be honest. Haven't you ever said that? Why doesn't God just tell me what he wants me to do? Why do I have to go looking for it? Well, here's one, one reason you'll have to go looking for it, so to speak. You'll have to trust God for wisdom. It's because when you get out in the neighborhood, there will be no cookie-cutter approach into dealing with the situations that you will find. Every single one is unique. Every individual story is a little different. And there is not one single approach that will meet every single one of them. You'll meet people and you'll, you'll, your jaw will drop. you say, how did, how did you get to this point? And then you'll say, how in, what in the world would be the next step forward for you? You're going to have to find out what pleases the Lord. You're going to have to trust God for discernment. Have brothers and sisters in Christ around you, gathered around you, and say, what should we do? Recently, I met with a small group of people, a mile and a half from here, to pray about a particular family dealing with a child that was not their own, but living with them because his home was horrendous. But it was not really a sustainable situation. So what are we going to do in this case with this child in this home? So they gathered people together and they prayed, God, show us what to do. You're going to have to find out what pleases the Lord. If you're going to join God in the neighborhood and be light in the darkness, you're going to need discernment for that for each individual case. It also means to, look what it says here, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Because there will always be a possibility and a temptation in your love for people and in your desire to identify with people, there will always be the possibility that you can just lapse into being what they are or doing what they do. And do you see how terribly unloving that would be for them if the light in their darkness went dark That's not going to help them one single little bit. And so while you are engaged with them, loving them, entering into their life, interacting with them, while you're doing that, you must remember you are and must always be radically different from them. Do not be partners with, do do not be on the same side. Don't be on that team, so to speak, pursuing those same goals. You can't rescue people when you yourself are drowning. So here's just a reminder that you are light. Don't let a bushel come over that light, but let it shine, so to speak. And then the third thing we see here is that that light will constantly be exposing the fruitless deeds of darkness. Paul's very bold here. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, rather expose them. For the light exposes evil. This is what's going to happen when you join God in the neighborhood. All right? It's going to be a disruptive thing, perhaps. It's going to be a thing when light comes into darkness. Now, some of the people that you meet in the neighborhood are so tired of their darkness. They're so beat down by it and exhausted by it that when light shows up in the neighborhood, they're drawn to it. They will come at you like moth to a flame because that light draws them. You'll see, you'll see when you join God in the neighborhood, there will be some people that will be drawn to you. They want to hang out with you. They kind of act like they're cool and all, but they keep showing up. 
They keep walking by your, your yard. Stuff like that happens. They're drawn to the light. That'll be easy for you because you could just start talking to them because they're going to keep coming back. But there'll be other people who are sort of intrigued. What are you doing? What makes you tick? You're different from us, whatever. They'll hang around a little bit and be interested and then kind of, oh, whatever. Everybody has their own thing and they'll walk away. And then there's a third group of people who will not like your presence at all because darkness, uh, light exposes darkness. And you make their life look really stupid and bad and broken. And everything was a little a bit easier to ignore till you showed up. And they will not like you, and they will say so. And they may siphon the gas out of your car and puncture your tires, and who knows what else they might do. You will be responded to in all kinds of ways. Some people will be attracted to you and come to you. Other people will have a look and then back away. Some people will actively resist and hate you. And then you realize, oh yeah, that's exactly like they treated Jesus, the light of the world. Exactly like that. And then you will know that you are light in that darkness just as he is. So I'm just wondering, who among us is going to do it? Who's going to join God in the neighborhood? Who among us has seen the light in such a way that he or she answers the call to be light in the darkness? You know, it takes courage to pray some things. We sometimes joke about praying for humility. Nobody ever does that. Nobody ever prays for patience because we know the means God uses often to develop humility and patience in us. Here's something else that's really takes a lot of courage to pray. What if you were to pray, Lord, show me the path into this neighborhood. Show me how to engage with people there in my neighborhood how to love the people who are there, how to be light in the darkness. God, show me, put me there. Put me in the lives of people as light in the darkness. Do you have the courage to pray that? It's going to change your agenda in your life, of course, if God does that. Because you will be light, remember, in the darkness. Do you have the courage to pray that? Jesus Christ came into your darkness, our darkness. He left the glory of heaven, born in a stable, living in, of all things, a mortal body. Oh, how humiliating, how limiting. He came into this darkness to rescue us to rescue you and me and then to engage us in what he continues to do to rescue people by becoming light in the darkness. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would call us by your grace to something radically different than our American culture would point us into I pray, Lord, that we would see from your vantage point how dark the world is in our neighborhoods, within our associations, our schools, our places of work. Lord, show us how dark it is and show us how we can engage there to be light in the darkness. May we do it out of grateful hearts for the light that you have shown us. In Jesus' name, amen.